Hey guys, welcome back to another video. And today we're gonna to be solving the leak code question, cherry pick up two. All right, so first I'm just gonna uh, read the question out and then we're gonna kind of represent it visually so we can understand what we're trying to achieve and how we could possibly solve the question. All right, so in this question, we're gonna be given a row sex columns matrix called grid, which represents a field of cherries. Each cell in a grid represents the number of cherries that you can collect. So let's say we have a grid over here and it has a value of five. That means at that grid, we can collect a total of five cherries. All right, so over here, we have two robots and these robots help us collect cherries. So we have robot one, which starts off at the top left corner. And then we have robot two, which starts off at the top right corner. Okay, so one's on the top left, one's on the top right. Okay, return the maximum number of cherries uh, collecting using both robots using the following rules, okay? So what is our basic goal or idea of this question? So we're given two robots, one which starts at the top left, one at the top right. And these robots over here are going to be moving around the cells and collecting cherries for us. And the main idea here is to get the maximum number of cherries. Okay, but, uh, so the robots over here can only move in one of these three directions, okay? So now let's kind of explore what these three directions actually represent. So let's go over here. And uh, before doing that real quickly, um, this would be our matrix, for example. So I just want you to realize that the topmost value is the green over here, right? So green is going to be represented by zero comma zero, okay? And simultaneously, the red is going to be the other robot. So green represents robot one and red, let's say it's robot two. So in this case, the index of this, so we're at the zeroth row. And in that, we're at the one, two, three, okay? So, sorry, a zero, one, two, right? We're indexing starting at zero. So zero, one, and two, so we're at zero, comma, two, okay? So these are going to be our two start positions. And also don't think of these as x, comma, y values. That is not what they are. Instead, they're i, comma, j, right? So it's the indices themselves of the matrix. Okay, so those are our two robot started positions. And now let's kind of uh, look into uh, the three moves that we have. So we have one move over here called i plus one, j minus one. Then we have i plus one and j. And then we have i plus one and j plus one, okay? So one thing that you could notice is that the i value over here stays, to, uh, sorry, the i value is always uh, increasing by one. So what does it mean when you're increasing i plus one? So i plus one is nothing else but moving one step down. Now that doesn't really make sense, but the reason that's true is because uh, this over here represents each index. So when you go, so this is the zero with row. This is the first row. This is the second row. This is the third row. So when you add one, you're actually moving down one, okay? So that's what's happening over here. That's what the I plus one actually means. So now let's actually apply that to each of the motions. So if you do I plus one, we would move down a bit, okay? And I'm sorry if I'm not drawing it according to proportion, but we're basically moving down one index or row, okay? So we're moving down. Now, what happens at J minus one? So at J minus one, let's just say that we are over here. So J minus one, we would end up with two minus one. So that means we end up going to the left. So if you do that, we would end up over here. So what is basically happening over here? So by doing this motion over here, I plus one comma J minus one, we're moving to down left, okay? So I'll just call it DL, okay? So over here we have I plus one and J, so J does not change. So in that case, we just move down one step and that's it. We don't move right or left. So now we're just going down. So I'll just call it D. And over here, we have I plus one, J plus one. So over here, we're moving down by one and we're moving to the right by one, okay? So these over here are our two motions and let's just call this DR. So using this, we're gonna try to solve our question. And before doing that, let's just look at the other conditions once. So when any robot is passing through a cell, it picks up all cherries and the uh, cell becomes an empty cell. So this is something that we wanna consider, right? So we have robot one over here and robot two over here. So let's say uh, technically both of them could end up at the square five. And let's say that's what they end up doing. So they both go to square five, but now the problem that's gonna actually happen is when they both go to square five over here, robot one can pick up five and robot two cannot also pick up five. So what I mean by that is only one of the robots could pick up the cherries at that certain square. So in this case, only one of them is gonna pick up those uh, number of cherries, okay? So that's one thing we wanna kind of keep note of. 
So when both robots stay on the same self, oh sorry, uh, only one of them takes the cherries, uh, both robots cannot move outside of the grid, and both robots should reach the bottom of the grid. Okay, so now this point actually uh, simplifies our question, and how exactly is that? So uh, going back to the movement we have here, what you want to notice is no matter what we do, we are always going to move one step down. So what that means is the number of moves is already known to us beforehand. How exactly is that true? Because over here, what is the length or sorry, the vertical length of our matrix? So in this case, we have one, two, three, four. We have four rows. So we're never going to exceed four values. And the reason for that is at each step, we're going to be moving one down. So one, two, three, and four. And by the fourth step, or actually to be more precise, it's only going to be three steps if you don't count the first one by itself, right? So let's just say uh, this is one step, two, and three. By that time over there, we're going to be at the very bottom. And once we are at the bottom, we're going to stop moving the robot and we're not going to be making any more motions. Because if we do do anything else, what's going to happen is we're going to go outside of our grid and also we just want to reach the bottom, okay? So that over there is the other condition. Okay, so now let's kind of see how can we solve our question here. Actually, before doing that, let's just look at this example over here. So uh, in this example, uh, what they did is, so we went to three, two, five, and two. Robot two got all of those. And robot, uh, sorry, robot one and robot two got one, five, five, and one. When you add them all up, that's the number of cherries and that's where we're gonna end up outputting. Okay, so this over here, uh, our main goal is to maximize the number of cherries we have. So we can, and to make it even simpler, we already know the rules that we need to follow, right? So there's a strict set of rules and we know that we can only move in three different directions. So kind of using both of them together, we can kind of take a recursive approach. And basically uh, going to go through all of the possible moves. Now, in this case, what are going to be all the possible moves? So we're going to have ro uh, moves for robot one. And we're also going to have moves for robot two. So for robot one, let's just call this row one and column one. Okay, so this refers to where we're currently at. And let's do the same for robot two. So row two, column two. Now, one thing you want to notice over here is that this would be kind of the input to our DP function over here. So what's gonna happen is we want to know the current row one and column one values and row two and column two values. Once we get these values, we are going to try out all of the possible moves. Now, what exactly are all of the possibilities of moves? So that's pretty simple. So at each robot, so each robot has three possible moves, okay? So three possible moves are available. And what are those? So you could do down left or just down and down right. Those are our three possibilities. So keeping that in mind, the total number of possibilities of moves we have are three for robot one and three for robot two. When you multiply them, you get a total of nine possible moves. So just to kind of illustrate a few of them, one of them would be down left, down left for robot one and robot two. Then you could do down left and down, down left and down right, and then you keep going on. You get a total of nine different possibilities. So we're gonna try out each of these nine different possibilities at each of the cells for both of the robots. Now, one thing we also wanna do is we want to understand which robot moves first. So let's take an example, right? So let's say uh, we move over here and, the, and then once uh, the green robot, the robot one moves there, it's gonna collect the cherries. So after doing that, what's gonna happen is the red robot uh, has to make a decision, but that's not really going to be fair. That is going to give us a completely different answer. So. Uh, an example for that is let's say if the red robot ended up moving first, then what would have happened is this would have collected the cherries, making it zero and changing the entire way the equation or the way the robot moves works. So to kind of fix this problem, what we're gonna do is we're gonna move both the robots at the same time. So let's say, uh, just real quickly, so let's say we have five cherries here. We have two cherries here and two cherries here. So what's gonna happen is this over here is going to move at the same time. Now again, remember we have three options for this to move. Uh, down, down right, and down left. We're gonna try all of the three possibilities. In this case, obviously down left is not possible for robot one, so we're gonna exclude that, okay? Now one more thing you wanna kind of make sure is that we have to try all three possibilities. So in this case, you might think, well, the best thing is for it to just to go to 
five because five has the maximum number of cherries. But we also want to think about the further conditions which are down below. And the perfect example for this is at example two over here. So basically, if you just look at this as it is, just the one, robot one, and we, we're currently at one. So the two options we have are going to two or zero. And just looking at that instance, two sounds like a better option. But when you further go down our uh, steps, right? So we don't actually get the best result by going to two. Instead, we get the best result by going to zero, then nine, then five, and two, right? And that is obviously a lot greater than doing something like one, two, two, three, and two. So you want to think about the further steps as well. Okay, so now that we know this, how exactly is our function going to work? So we've kind of established that our function is going to take in four parameters. Row one, column one, row two, column two. Now, can we simplify this by any way? And we can. And the reason for that is because we know at each of our moves, we're always going to be moving down by one. So that means that row one is always going to be equal to row two. Actually, this meant row. So row one always equals to row two. So we can simplify this and keep track of only one row, which corresponds to both column one and column two. So now we've kind of simplified our inputs and now we only have three inputs. So now what exactly is going to happen? So now what we're gonna do is at each iteration, we're gonna be trying out each of these three moves. So we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna move down by one. Uh, we're either gonna, uh, we're either not going to change the J value, uh, do J plus one or do J minus one. And each time we're gonna go all the way to the bottom of all of the possible steps. In the beginning, we're gonna try one, two, and three. We're gonna try all of those three steps. And once we go, to, let's say we go to this cell over here, we're again gonna try all of the other possible values. So that is what we're going to be doing. And at the ending, we're gonna, and each time we're gonna be keeping track of the number of cherries we end up collecting. And what we're gonna do by the ending of this is we're gonna output which kind of possibility gives us the maximum number of cherries that we can collect. Okay, and I know I did not explain it fully over here. And the reason for that is because I think it's easier to understand in the code and I will be coding it out and explaining how it works. Okay, so let's start off by creating our helper function, okay? So in this function, we're gonna uh, be giving it three values. So the first value over here is going to be the row. And again, the row is the same for column one and column two. So those over there are going to be our three parameters. So now let's just start off by creating our recursive part of this, okay? So we're gonna uh, talk about move one. So let's just do for M1. So what are going to be the three possibilities for M1? And it's gonna be for M1 in this. So what are the three possibilities? So M1, uh, one of the possibilities is that we go to the left by one. So if you go to the left, it's going to be column minus one. The other possibility is column one plus one. And the final possibility is that we don't move right or left. So we just stay at column one. Now we're going to repeat this for M2. So for M2, and let's just actually, let's just do it. So column two minus one, that's one of our possibilities. Then we have column two plus one, and then we have column one sorry, column two as it is, okay? So as it is, uh, we're gonna be getting a total of nine possibilities. And let me just print it out to kind of show you what I mean. So as you can see, we actually ended up with nine different values. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, and three again. So that's a total of nine values. And those represents the, uh, that represents the nine different possibility possibilities of moves we can make at a certain cell. And one more thing you would uh, want to notice is that this, uh, the moves that are happening over here are for both robot one and robot two. They're happening at the same time. Okay, so now you, that you understand what these two for loops are doing, uh, we wanna kind of be able to call this function on itself for different possibilities. Now, before we do that, we actually wanna look at uh, some things that happened over here. So if you scroll down, you'll be able to see that we have negative one, right? And that doesn't make sense we cannot have any negative indices, right? We want to stay inside of the grid. So that is something that we want to filter out. So how exactly are we gonna filter that out? So what would, uh, one thing that's gonna happen is our M1 value has to be greater than or equal to zero. And at the same time, our M2 value also has to be greater than or equal to zero. 
And simultaneously, so that's uh, only looking at the left bound, we also want to look at the right boundary. So to do that, uh, our uh, so M1 has to be less than our right boundary. So before doing that, let's define our right and left boundary. So let's just call this the number of columns and the number of rows that we have. Sorry, number. Okay, um, and uh, that's going to be equal to, so what the number of columns is going to be the length. We're going to go to our grid and we'll just go to whatever set zero. So let's just get that. And for the number of rows, we'll just do length of grid. Okay, perfect. So now that we have this over here, we want to check if M1 has to be less than the number of columns that we have. And at the same time, M2 has to be less than the number of columns we have as well. So only and only if this happens, we're going to do something over here. So if we go inside of this if condition, then in that case, we are at a valid point, okay? So we're not outside of the grid. Okay, and in this case, what exactly are we going to be doing? So over here, we're going to be calling this function on itself recursively. So to do that, what's going to happen is we're going to do helper and uh, what is going to happen to the value of the row. So we're going to do row plus one since we are going to be going down by one. And over here, our move uh, for column one is going to be M1 and for column two is going to be M2. Now we don't know what we're doing with this yet. So we still need to add that functionality over here. Okay, so now let's come to the main part of the question. Now the main part or the reason we're doing this recursion is because we want to try all the possibilities and we want to get the maximum number of cherries that we can collect at a certain point. So that is what we want to include over here. Over here, we're going to count the number of cherries, okay? So how exactly are we going to do that? So let's start off by setting the number of cherries to be equal to zero. Now, what we're going to do is, let me just write it down. So we're going to do cherries plus equals, and let's go to our grid. The row is going to be the same, so let's just go to row. And now we want to go to the column. So let's just do column one. And obviously, we also want to account for the values of the second robot. So let's just copy this over, and instead of column one, we're going to have column two. Now, what is wrong with this, okay? So the only small mistake that we have with this uh, is that there might be a point where we are at the same cell. So let's just go up here and real quickly, let's say both the robots end up at five. And when that actually ends up happening, let's say both the robots are at five, then in that case, only one of the robots is going to actually get the cherries, while the other one is going to end up getting zero. So that is something we want to consider. So to kind of simplify that or to add that condition, we're only going to add the number of cherries from whatever we get from robot one, right? So whatever comes from column one. And when exactly are we going to add the cherries that come from column two? So we're only going to add the cherries that come from column two if we are not at the same point. So if column one is not equal to column two, then in that case, what, sorry, column two, then in that case, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to add this to it. So cherries, so cherries plus equals grid row column two. And to actually simplify this instead of doing cherries plus equal, we can just define cherries to be this uh, from the beginning instead of zero. Okay, so this over here gives us the number of cherries. Now the question is, when exactly do we reach an end point? Now we reach an end point when we reach the last row. How exactly do we get that? Now we already stored its value over here. So this over here tells us the number of rows we have. So one thing you want to realize is that the number of rows starts counting at one, while indexing starts off at zero. So in that case, what's going to happen is we're going to check if our row is equal to the number of rows minus one. And again, we're doing minus one because counting of length starts off at one. And if that is the case, that means we are at the last row. And in that case, we're going to return the number of cherries. Okay, perfect. So now we've reached some sort of endpoint and uh, we know what to do. But one thing that, that we still need to fix is we want to be updating the number of cherries we have. So how exactly are we going to be doing that? So to do that, outside of our for loop, we're going to have a temporary value. So let's just call this value over here zero. So how exactly is this temporary value actually going to work? So now the basic idea between this temporary value over here is we're going to be taking this temporary value and for each of these nine possibilities, we're going to be finding a certain number of uh, cherries we're going to be getting at that certain point. So at the beginning, it's going to be zero. And what we're going to do 
is our temporary value. We're going to update it at each time. So our temporary value is going to be the maximum between the old temporary value and this recursive function over here. Again, remember this m1 and m2 is going to give us a total of nine possibilities, three for m1 and three for m2. So at the ending of this, temporary is going to be the maximum number of cherries we can get out of nine different possibilities, okay? So now that we've actually gotten this uh, temporary value and we know that it is the maximum from the nine different possibilities, what we're going to do is we're going to go outside of it and we're going to return that value. So we're going to take our temporary value and this temporary value over here, we're going to add it with the number of cherries that we actually have, uh, which we get at the very beginning. So temp plus cherries. And this gives us the maximum amount of cherries we have. And finally, we want to call our function over here. So to call our function, oh, we want to return its value. And in this case, we're going to do helper. Uh, the row is going to start off at the zeroth index. Our uh, column one is also going to start at the top left. So we gave it zero. And finally, uh, this instead of five, we're going to be giving it the value of the number of columns we have. And we're going to subtract it by one. Okay, perfect. And one last thing that you want to do, or if you notice it, and if you look at this, what's going to end up happening inside of our function over here is that at some point there's going to be repetition or the same amount, same calls are going to be made several times. And that's just going to be a waste of time for us. So how exactly can we fix it? So we can fix this by using memoization. So you can implement that by yourself using uh, some sort of array, or you could have a memoization function. But instead of doing all of that, we'll just use the inbuilt LRU cache and you can get that by importing func tools or function tools. Okay, so LRU underscore cache, LRU cache stands for least recently used cache and it basically stores these values. And the, we want to uh, specify the, the maximum size of this. So instead of just writing it, so the maximum size is going to be none. So we don't actually have a maximum size for our cache. Okay, so this over here is going to be it and let's submit it. And as you can see, our submission did get accepted. So finally, thanks a lot for watching, guys. Do let me know if you have any questions and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you.